Welcome to PR Talk, sponsored by the PRSA of Oregon. This is your host, Amy Rosenberg, founder of Veracity and author of A Modern Guide to Public Relations. Help other people find our podcast by subscribing, rating, giving us a review, or sharing on social media. Thanks for tuning in. Hi, I have Mary Davies here, and she founded Beanstalk Internet Marketing 17 years ago. Hi, Mary. Hi, Amy. How are you? Good. So today, actually, I'd of course love to talk to Mary about her company, which I think she runs with her husband too, like I do. But today we're going to talk about her Engage presentation from this summer, because honestly, I thought it was the most interesting presentation because... It was not about digital marketing. Sorry, marketers, <laughs> but it's like not that interesting sometimes. So her her title of her presentation was How to Be Okay Sucking at Stuff. <laughs> so, That's it. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us what you meant by that title and then why you chose to take that topic on specifically for marketers? Yeah, for sure. So it was funny. I had a few different ideas for titles. And and honestly, that one was just straight to the point. Like, let's not muck about it. You know, it, I've, I've been to enough sessions in my life where I read the title and I got there and I was like, oh, that's what they meant. You know, <laughs> so this mm-hmm. one was pretty straightforward. Yeah. How to not, you know, how to be okay, not sucking at stuff. Um, it wasn't it in all honesty, it wasn't my idea in it. Well, I guess it was my idea in the roundabout, but to to sort of jump out of the marketing space and more into sort of you know, mental health career, you know, that sort of thing um, for a presentation that was actually proposed to me from um, someone at SEMPDX. And they said, you know, hey, this is a space that, you know, you sort of talk about, we know each other one on one, you know, is it is it something you'd be comfortable presenting on? And at first, I was like, no, yes, maybe I don't know, you know, I was a little bit hesitant. But Then I thought, yeah, no, it is. I think it's a message that really needs to get out there. Um, As an employer myself, I see the need for it, you know, with employees. But I also have, as you, you know, saw in my presentation, experienced so many learning moments of my own (laughs) where Mm -hmm. I had to learn to be okay sucking at stuff. So, um, yeah, it was it wasn't my idea to begin with. But then um, then it sort of turned into this after a little bit of discussion. But uh, yeah, I, I, I enjoyed it. It was fun to actually step outside of, you know, the technical sort of marketing speak that we live in on our day to day. So yeah, I was excited for the opportunity. Yeah. And I just kind of want to dig into some of the topics you went over. And I guess how I'm taking that title, how to be okay sucking at stuff is like, basically we don't suck and we just need to give ourselves a break and things don't have to be perfect all the time. And, and also there's a little bit of thought about boundaries that we can talk about, but yeah, Yeah. you, you talked about imposter syndrome, perfectionism, you know, unrealistic expectations. So I don't know if you want to just kind of fill us in on some of those big topics. Yeah, it was, you know, it is, it's, it's, a, it's a lot to cover. And even when I was putting this deck together, I was like, oh, gosh, you know, we could be here all year. Because um, <laughs> there's mm-hmm. just so much that we can talk about. But ultimately, you're right, like, it, it's not about, you know, oh, let's strive to suck at stuff necessarily. But the but the recognition that we're all going to fail, we're all going to not be the best at everything we try, but none of us will be the masters, none of us will find, you know, those things that we are amazing at or can excel at if we don't put ourselves out there and give it a go. And I think that it's it's really a scary space for a lot of people to go into, especially, you know, we we live in a very social media driven world. I myself work in the social media space a lot. Um, there's a ton of negativity out there. Um, I think I covered it in my presentation, you know, people asking, you know, those stupid questions, air quotes around that word stupid, um, in, you know, marketing groups, um, places that should feel safe to go to and and go, hey, guys, you know, what do you think of this? Or I read this somewhere or whatever. And I see examples sometimes of of people being, you know, sort of torn to shreds, like, how could you think that or da 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 da, you know, and, and I think it sort of sets this tone of, fear. <laughs> it's it's not okay to go out there and ask questions and to try something new. And what if you, you know, fall flat on your face in front of all of your peers, and especially, you know, if you're newer in the industry, I actually am going to correct that, especially for everyone, because I think for even those of us who have maybe been in the industry for so long, it's even, you know, it's terrifying for us to put ourselves out there too. Mm-hmm. So 
Um, you don't want to go, oh, yeah, I've been doing this for 15 plus years. And here I am, you know, sucking at mm-hmm. stuff. <laughs> I mean, in a personal level, have you ever asked a question where you felt it was stupid and someone actually said, I, and I'm not talking about social media. Honestly, I don't even think social media counts. I think it's more <laughs> about, for me, I don't want to ask a stupid question in front of my clients. And if I ever yep. have, I don't think that they've ever said anything rude. And and sometimes I just couch it. Like, I just need to be sure that I'm sure you said this already, but you know, here's the question. I, I don't know if you have any tips for that or has anyone ever been rude to you after you asked a question? You know what? Yes, they have, but never coming from opinions I really value. <laughs> You know, um, I find that just generally when you when you get that pushback, it may be, you know, sort of aggression back to those questions that maybe were obvious or maybe, you know, you didn't have the correct information um, to inform it in the beginning. Um, I think those people who sort of want to take you down for for your vulnerability um, are not people you want to be working with, you know, whether they're a client or or a peer Um that's usually a pretty good red flag of this is not a really great relationship to be in. Um, I think Mm -hmm. that, yeah, it's easy for us to be fearful of, you know, people are going to be really mean or or snap at us. Um, But at the same time, you know, I always try and go, what would I do if someone else asked that question? What's my natural inclination? Is it to sort of lambast them? Is it to make them feel terrible about it? But it's not. I'm actually going to go the opposite route and try to make sure that they don't feel bad for that, you know, asking that question or, or for, for whatever, you know, misunderstanding was there. And I find that most people, you know, especially in a working relationship, you know, with a client, they're usually pretty good at just going, oh, you must have missed this piece of information or, you know, Mm -hmm. something like that. Um, Mm -hmm. Any of the experiences where I've had where it's been negative have, have actually been more of a sort of you know, peer um, experiences, Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to with clients. Um, I'm very lucky. I we've had such a long run of amazing clients in our company. So I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful to have, you know, um, clients that I can fail in front of. And in fact, I enjoy failing in front of um, it to some degree, I like to be able to work with people who encourage me to go outside of the norm and and take some risks and um, that they're excited to sort of see where we can go if we, if we, you know, maybe do try something that, that, that not everybody else is doing. So, um, and Mm -hmm. I think I mentioned that in uh, the session as well, you know, as an employer needing to make sure that we are creating that space for our employees as well and encouraging them to, mm-hmm. you know, take those risks and maybe, you know, make mistakes for sure. Like, and the question shouldn't be, you know, why, you know, why didn't you understand that? But more like, what could I, I have done to help mm-hmm. you have better understood that, you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah, taking yourself, a little responsibility. Yeah. 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 And also not wanting to ask stupid <laughs> questions. It makes us slower in our work too, because when you don't understand something, then it's just, everything takes longer. And, and then that points to, for me, perfectionism. So I don't yeah. like being perfect. I use, well, I'm a recovering uh, perfectionist, but I don't like being perfect because it makes me slow. Yeah. Um, and I'm always double checking and there's a confidence issue. I think perfectionists are, they don't have well, I, I don't want to say for everybody, but I feel like it's a comp- was a confidence issue for me, and um, I and of course I'm not recovered. I always um, have to kind of check myself um, and work towards just moving forward. And and I guess perfectionism has you know there's a fear of failure um, or looking stupid. I don't know what you how you think those two relate and what you think about that specifically Abs- in the marketing industry. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, perfectionism is, as you said, it can be a bit of a time waster. Um, y- you can get hung up on the the small details that maybe don't really matter in the long run. Um, I like to bring perfectionism in. Well, okay. 
truth be told, I am a bit of a perfectionist too, yeah, but yeah. I strive to bring perfectionism in when we're in the finishing touches, you know, when we've already done our, our sort of mushy, mashy, you know, sloppy experimentation period, then we can sort of, you know, bring in those perfectionist uh, qualities and, and use them to our advantage. But, um, you know, it, it, it reminds me back to like when we first started a company, you know, years and years and years ago, and it was literally just me and my husband sitting at a desk, the two of us, and I was handling all of our financial stuff and, you know, bookkeeping and everything. And I quickly learned that somebody who is a perfectionist like myself, um, that is a bad job for because I literally would like I'd spend three hours hunting down that one penny. You know, mm -hmm. I couldn't just <laughs> let it go. I couldn't let it go. I needed mm -hmm. it to be there. And I'm like, you know, I can pass it off to a bookkeeper who they'll they'll decide whether or not that penny matters. You know, they'll they'll um, take that job on. But yeah, we can very easily sort of get caught up in in um, those perfectionist tendencies that aren't really beneficial whatsoever to the task at hand. Um, but I think, you know, when you're saying that your perfectionism for yourself, you believe is rooted sort of in um, a confidence issue. I think for me, I would echo that in a slightly different way. I would say that it comes from an anxiety, a place of mm -hmm. anxiety for me. And it gives me a sense of control and it helps me to feel like I can predict sort of what's coming and, and I can know that I've done my best. And, you know, if, if it does fall apart, then I can look back and go, oh, well, it wasn't me. I did everything I could or whatever mm -hmm. it might be. Mm -hmm. um, so it's that, you know, again, that fear of looking stupid, that fear of having done it wrong or, or missed something. And so for me, it's very anxiety based why I tend to go into that perfectionist thinking. Mm, interesting. Probably is for me too. But I mean, and it also <laughs> kind of falls along the lines of imposter syndrome, I think. I mean, I'm not sure. Um, what's your definition of imposter syndrome? Imposter syndrome, you know, imposter syndrome, I find very interesting, because if you read up on it, there's a lot of sort of questioning as far as, you know, is this really a, a diagnosis or not? But it is so commonly used, this term. Um, and and so many people, especially, I haven't seen an industry actually with such a high prevalence of it as our own. Um, mm -hmm. And so many people start talking about it. And to me, it's really just that sense of not belonging, that sense of, you know, that fish out of water, that feeling of um, the being the kid in the room of the adults, you know, it's... it's mm -hmm. I grew up with two older siblings and I was the tag along, you know, I was the one that, you know, my two older sisters were going in the mall and my mom made them take me. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Fun. Thanks mom. <laughs> yeah. And it was sort of like that, you know, that's how I can often feel when I'm, you know, experiencing that imposter syndrome. It's like, you know, even though I've been at this for as long as I have and, and, I've clearly done a decent job of it. You know, my business is doing well. You know, if I was so terrible mm -hmm. at it, I probably wouldn't still be here. Um, but it's just easy to always look at, well, that person is bigger or better or smarter or more successful or, um, you know, or if you, for myself, you know, I think I mentioned it in, in you know, one of my epic failures or things that I sucked at sort of at the end of my session was um, I had a strong sort of passion for the idea of UX and SEO sort of working together. And this was long before it actually did on paper, you know, but to me, it was such an important sort of aspect that was being overlooked for the value of SEO. And I started to see sort of little bits and pieces, you know, sort of hints that maybe Google was starting to think that way. And I was terrified to put myself out there. And anytime I would sort of, you know, say a word or two, it would get a ton of, you know, pushback. So it was really easy to just shut up and stay in my corner, you know, and, and, and not be brave in that, um, in that moment. And I think that I gave into that and I sort of actually strengthened my imposter syndrome for a really mm. long time with that. Because every time I would say something, it would be, no, don't do that. Don't say that. You know, I well, okay. So uh, first of all, I'm sorry that that happened. Secondly, I, I mean, I just want to say I've heard this and I kind of believe it. If you get a lot of pushback or a lot of criticism, maybe you're doing something right. 
is what I've heard. And I'm kind of excited for the day that I get a negative review on my book. Not really. Of course, I'll be hurt, but you know, whatever. Um, so you can't please them all. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's like you're doing something right. If someone cares enough to say something. I suppose that's true. You know, I hadn't actually thought that. And you're right. You're right. You know, if it, if it was so inconsequential, you probably wouldn't have any feedback at all. So, um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, so I guess two points on imposter syndrome. One is, um, I think, do you think that we have more imposter syndrome in our industry because it's always changing and because we're humble and we don't want to assume we know everything and we have to stay on top of everything? Yeah, I think there is definitely an element of that. I think, you know, for, I can only speak to my own experience, but I think that especially, you know, those of us who have been in this industry, you know, for sort of the the longer haul, um, so much has changed so fast. You know, the, it, when I started out in this, it, it really was a one one man show, you know, you could literally handle all of the aspects of, of a marketing campaign as one individual. And very quickly, you know, over a number of years, but but very quickly that changed, you know, especially with like the social media um, aspect of things coming out. But it, but you've got social media and you've got paid ads and you've got, you know, SEO and you've got like, you know, not just SEO, you've got your organic or your you've got your um, content marketing and you've got your technical, you know, like my husband does technical SEO. That's basically what he does. He used Mm -hmm. to do everything. Um, He does do a lot of paid as well. But but yeah, like I think there's just this inability to actually be the master of it all Mm -hmm. anymore. And yet you feel like, you know, for myself, um, because of sort of when I started in this industry, a lot of the relationships that I have formed over the years have turned into sort of, I've surrounded myself with a lot of technical SEOs. That is not a strength for me. I don't know what I'm doing. I get in there and I am lost. Um, mm-hmm. And so I've like literally surrounded myself with a bunch of friends who are way smarter than me. Um, well, in some <laughs> way, maybe not in all ways, but yeah. Correct. But see, and that's it. But I think somebody who is sort of, you know, like when we talk about that imposter syndrome, you know, I never flip the coin and go, oh, I wonder if they feel that way when they're talking to me and I'm discussing UX, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's easy for us to to sort of go negative on our own selves and go, oh, they must think I'm an idiot because I don't know, you know, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. eight different coding languages or whatever. Um, but at the same time, I forget to think that, oh, they might be feeling that same way when I start going on about like UX elements and they just sort of gloss over. So it's it's easy to only look at, you know, that one side of ourselves that's very judgmental. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it comes out and uh, naturally. So last thing about imposter syndrome, and I don't know where I get got this or if it's just from what people say and I just pick it up, but I've always kind of said those who identify as women have uh, imposter syndrome, <laughs> which is like more, you know, more women have imposter syndrome. I don't know. I mean, I know you're not a psychologist, but it just feels like maybe that's the case. What do I know? Yeah, I, you know, I have no idea what the stats on that are. Um, My argument would be, you know, I think that women typically, if we're going to just generalize, are generally a little more comfortable speaking about it than than a lot of men are. I know I'm saying Mm. this, you know, take it with a grain of salt because I can only speak to the relationships I have. I know I'm much more able to share my sort of mental health challenges and, and moments like that, you know, these imposter syndrome moments, um, then say my husband is, he's, he tends to be a lot quieter in that space. Um, Mm -hmm. that said, I learned the term imposter syndrome from a, from a male industry peer. He's the one who actually Facebook messaged me one day and said, do you know anything about this? This, I think, is something you might be interested in. And I was like, oh, God, that's me. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Oh, well, that's cool. So, yeah, okay. That totally makes sense, actually, that we just talk about it a little bit more um, or more possibly vulnerable. Um, so I just want to say, you know, going back to the what kind of clients you take, uh, yeah, I would never want to take a client that made me feel stupid because part of marketing is asking questions. So I wouldn't feel very good about that. But just randomly, I saw on your website, I was popping around there. And by the way, I love this. I'm like, okay, I need to talk to you about this. There's a pop-up that comes up on your website's 
not taking clients. <laughs> I'm like, ooh. So now can you tell me about that and just boundaries in general around that? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a big boundary, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So long story short, um, my husband and I, uh, started our company, yeah, like 17 years ago, I guess it was. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And we've we've sort of lived through many different sort of seasons in in our company and grown larger and pulled back and grown again and pulled back. And ultimately, what it's always come down to is um, neither of us. Okay, how do you know? Let's talk about second stuff. Neither of us enjoy. Um, sort of, you know, being the the big boss man and just managing a bunch of employees. So we've tried to stay very small. Um, mm -hmm. We like to work with employees that aren't really employees, but rather are more like partners with, you know, that that we can just really trust to take on certain elements of the work and that can have really positive, great relationships with our existing uh, client base. We, we really decided that we didn't want to grow as much outside of our current client base, but rather within our client base. So that's sort of the the short story within that is just sort of keeping, we love the relationships that we have with our, with our existing clients. And the few times that, you know, we've done that, we've grown and then we've pulled back and we've sort of trimmed it down and we've got, okay, here's our, you know, favorite clients. Can I say that? But yeah. mm -hmm, <laughs> and mm -hmm. anybody who we've cut, they're like, shoot, what? No, what? Mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, just those people that, you know, we can get passionate about what they're, what they're marketing and, and what they're selling and, and what their messaging is and that we can work with their team and that they encourage us to just, you know, throw caution to the wind and try something new. And, um, th that we, like, I'm happy to go to work, and, and talk with them and be with them and, you know, sort of it, it's more collaborative. So that's why we're not taking more clients because we just don't, we, we're not, our goal is not to um, just get bigger and, mm -hmm. and make more money. It's really to enjoy what we do and, and make sure that our clients are enjoying it as well. Yeah. And so you're happy with what you, where you are in life. Yep. Um, you know, yep. the phrase you are enough, I mean, it kind of extends to this in a way like your business is enough, where you are is enough, um, yeah. you know, and sometimes when you make the decision not to grow, which I haven't gotten to that point, but I, it, it's quite tempting sometimes. Um, yeah. I think, well, something's wrong. Like I, I shouldn't feel like this. I shouldn't, you know, and I don't know if it's like an American kind of thing where we're constantly striving or it's consumerism. We constantly want more, more, more. Yeah. I think there's so much of, you know, I watch my peers all the time being burnt out. And like, let's, let's be honest that, you know, our little chat before we started here, I was like, ah, I think I'm going to work all weekend. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's been a busy morning. So mm -hmm. it's not that, that there isn't exhaustion and, and, you know, hard weeks and hard days and hard months. Um, and it's not that we aren't, you know, striving to grow, you know, as I said, we do have growth goals, but they're within our current client base and, mm -hmm. and they're with clients who we can see the opportunity to do that with. Um, as you know, the whole, you know, sales cycle is, is, is an animal of its own. <laughs> the whole pitching and the, you know, mm -hmm. the, just the work that goes into that is, is quite time consuming. Um, so it, being in the position to be able to focus inward and into what we've built already is, is a, it's a, it's a position that I know we have not always been in. So I'm very grateful for it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that, yeah, there is, you know, I've got some friends that are, that are working themselves to death. Literally. I see, I see them talking about it, you know, like working till all hours of the night <clears throat> and then back at it first thing in the morning and, and we have to have a line and go, you know, what are, what's the end goal? I guess it's not really a line that it won't cross, but what is the end goal? What are you mm -hmm. working towards? I think if we're working ourselves constantly, always pushing for more, 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 but we don't have a stopping point that can be dangerous. Mm, so yeah, it's like, when is it enough? <laughs> yeah. So I think, you know, just having that, that goal in mind, that's, that's when it's enough. And then that's when I'll pull back. Um, that's helpful. Otherwise you can always, you can always bump it up, right? You know, mm -hmm. you can always yeah. move that line. 
So you can always change your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. And you mentioned working all weekend. Well, the thing is, is you're not going to be doing a business pitch all weekend. So it's no. stuff that you know, you know, you already yeah. know you enjoy. The thing about yes. doing business pitches, maybe that's not fun, first of all. Secondly, then you might grab a client that it's just not, <laughs> you, you realize it's not maybe what you enjoy or it's just not working. Yeah. Um, not that that's happened a lot for us, but I think when you do speak with new pot- potential clients, you do open yourself up to not, ha- you know, just maybe not even ha- feeling that great or having the best conversation. And when you don't have a good conversation, you realize, okay, well, th- that's not for me. I don't need that client, but yeah. it's just opening yourself up to this new level of, uh, tran- you know, vulnerability, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that, you know, being able to, I think all of us, you know, in the beginning, when we started out our careers, you know, you were sort of just grateful for anybody who wanted to talk to you. (laughs) You It's like, Mm -hmm. oh, somebody wants to hire me. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And then you really do sort of sacrifice your own self a lot in those conversations. I think, well, at least Mm -hmm. I did, you know, where you're sort of pandering to, to them and just begging for business. But but um, yeah, to, to have a little more calm and confidence and ability to sort of go, you know, is this a good fit as opposed to, you know, hope they hire us. Um, there is definitely a lot of um, sort of gratitude I have to be in that position because it hasn't always been that way. And I know that not everybody is in that position. So I don't want anyone listening to this to, you know, sort of be like, oh, well, it's nice for you, you know, because I don't think that's fair either. There have been Mm -hmm. times I have taken on clients that I did not like and that were really hard to work with, but that was what paid the bills. So that's what I had to do. So there's nothing wrong with that. But um, I think the goal, you know, has to be, to hopefully get to the point where you can sort of create those boundaries for yourself and, and you can have those clients that you can, you know, suck at things with <laughs> getting mm-hmm. back to that, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it kind of goes the same with new, um, people in the field, like who are employees, you know, we don't have to take, you know, we don't have to take a, a new job just because it's more, you know, money or better title or something if you're happy where you are but absolutely yeah. and i think i do you know you see people chasing sort of yeah the 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 pay or the position the title whatever it might be and you know if that's what the value is to you then i say go for it like if that is what drives you and makes you happy then why not but if if that is not what brings you joy and, and you know contentment in your day then why why do it <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, so you got to make the, you know, I I could make more money for sure, you know, if I didn't have that pop up. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But you also have a cost. There's a cost. So making more money, there's a cost to it. See, there is, there is both a mental health and a, you know, physical in the bank account cost. There is, it's, it takes a lot of energy and, and finances to do those pitches and to, you know, do the handholding through that whole process. So. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yeah. I know. So, yeah. well, thank you <laughs> we so much. <laughs> well, yeah. And thank you. Speaking of boundaries, I will respect your boundaries so you don't have to work <laughs> all weekend. But um, thank you so much for taking the time. And we'll um, definitely want to learn more. Do you talk about any of this in, you know, your blog or other places where we could just check yeah. in or you know i haven't been doing a lot of um publishing for quite some time it's just a it's just the respecting of my time boundaries but um if you look at look me up on linkedin um in I've got some stuff posted on there, a lot of my decks that I've done and that sort of thing on SlideShare. Um, And uh, yeah, it's funny because I work in the social media space. I'm not overly active personally in the social media space. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, uh, it's that whole cobbler son has no shoes business. Mm -hmm. Um, That tends to be what I always mention that with our website, actually, whenever I have talks, I'm like, do not judge my UX uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) by my own site, please. Well, you're working on your client's (laughs) UX. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah, you don't have time for your own. But yeah, LinkedIn is a great place to find me. That's where you found me. And uh, that's where a lot of, you know, uh, decks that I've, I've uh, done before, you can find links to and, um, and publications and that sort of thing. Yeah. And we'll just include that in the blog post. Yeah. So thank you so much. Um, it was really great talking to you and, you know, having a real conversation <laughs> about yeah. how we really work, you know. 
Yeah, it's that it's that sort of day to day stuff. And I think, yeah, it was it was super fun to be given the opportunity to talk about this. And then I'm glad that you were there to hear it. And then we got to connect here and have this chat. So that's awesome. Yeah. Thank you for thank having you me. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the PR Talk podcast. Find Amy's book, A Modern Guide to Public Relations, plus more PR Talk episodes at prtalk.co. And remember to subscribe, rate, and review.